I have a quote here, and, and that is uh, from William Goldman from his book, Which Lie Did I Tell? And he says, uh, you have to protect your writing time, you have to protect it to the death. Hmm. So are you protective of your creative time, and how so? Yes. Okay, so I've never, I'm not one of those people that have a difficulty with motivation. I, I'm like a slingshot. I, I have a, my rubber band is always, hey, rubber band? Yeah, my rubber band is always drawn tight. Like I'm, for me, it's not a question of will I be motivated to do it. It's, it's a question of when can I get to it. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit obsessive too, so I don't really follow, I, I, I don't have much of, writer's block is a real thing. I don't believe writer's block has anything to do with motivation or anything like that. A lot of it just has to do with like baking your metaphors in your, in your subconscious until they're ready to come out and present themselves as a meaningful experience. Um, so for me, I don't write every day. I write a lot, I'm very prolific, but I spend most of my time in Storyville, you know, like I spend most of my time kind of in this meditation or concentration. Like for example, I, you know, while I'm painting and drawing, it's like one part of my brain can be focused on painting, drawing, um, working on storyboards or something like that. And then the other part of my brain is sitting there plotting out the next scene and, um, connecting all these different things. So a lot of it comes down to um, I'm constantly thinking about story. I'm constantly coming up with stories. I have a list of more than a hundred different uh, like novels, screenplays, comic books, short stories that I'm working on. Right now I'm you know juggling three different uh, well two features and uh, two pilots that I'm writing actively. One in particular that I'm really excited about. Um, so, as far as protecting my time, uh, art's always been my priority. Like, probably, some friends say it's, it might be a little bit of an unhealthy attachment to my art because I tend to be a little obsessive. And, uh, but you know, it's what brings me meaning. It's, it makes nothing makes me happier than sitting down and writing a great scene, and then having somebody read it, and then making it better. You know, and it's it's also making a beautiful painting or shooting an amazing scene that like just nails exactly what I'm going for or cutting the pieces together, like editing and stuff. It's just the process of art is magical to me. So for me, it's I find so much fulfillment from it that it's m most of the time I can't wait to get to the cafe and write or I can't wait to get to my chair and write or. I can't wait to get to the computer and draw or paint. So it's, but I, I know that like a lot of people do struggle with that. I just haven't been one of those people that do. I think that's great. At least you're not making someone else your higher power. I mean, you're making your art in some sense. Yeah. I think that's actually great because that's something that's within you and you're yeah. not depending on another person for it. So I actually sure. think that's healthy, but mm. has there ever been a time when you feel like you, you're not spending enough time on creating something, whether it's painting, writing, and you're like, I need to defend my time to do it, and I need to make room for it. Well, like I said before, in the, in the sense of like, I love painting, I love drawing, I love working on designing comic books, I love designing characters, modeling, things like that. But I've made the conscious to source choice that right now, the best thing I can do is invest in my writing. Um, I spent a lot of my career working on other people's stories and other people's, like, uh, you know, I get to work on Kung Fu Panda, Legends of Awesomeness, and Monsters vs. Aliens, and things like that, and it's been amazing. I love working in the story department. I love collaborating with producers and other writers and stuff. Um, but um, I've made a very conscious effort to, for example, the. I made a very conscious effort to... Um, make sure that I'm focusing my discipline where it's going to pay off. So, so for example, right now I'm, I'm uh, working on a television show. I've been working, I wrote a pilot. He's read it, flipped over it. We're working together and we're currently shopping it around and we're very excited about it. Um, but uh, you know what, I wanna pitch it to you. 
You want to hear it? Okay, sure. Cool. Do you want me to pretend I'm assistant or? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> um, well, actually, this can tie into a little bit about how the, uh, like, okay, so the biggest thing we're looking for when we're, when we're writing is that we're trying to, you know, pull the metaphors from ourselves and make it mean something to somebody else. And ultimately, that's talking about theme. Theme tends to be um, essentially moral in nature. Now, a lot of people, like, for example, uh, uh, Robert McKee, he, he calls it the controlling idea. And I like that he approaches it that way because what he, like, especially during that time, there was kind of this tendency to be like, we don't want to moralize stories. Because when you try and use a story to convey a moral, it starts coming off as preachy and then you disengage from it and then you don't buy into it. So it's, it's good to have that kind of removal. But at its core, it really is a kind of moral experience. And, and by moral, I mean um, something that has survival value. Okay, so like I just, oh sorry, go a ahead. Principle, a principle of the way the world works with survival value. So for example, if you lie, it ends up biting you in the ass. So that's a claim about the way the world works or the way the universe works. So if you tell this, if you tell this lie, people find out about it and then it catches up to you. Um, so and what we're doing essentially is every single story is ex essentially expressing a kind of uh, moral value. That moral value is the theme. So the character is essentially there to experience the rules of the universe and then adapt to whatever that moral theme is. So let me see if I understand this. I'm, I'm going to take the example. Or pay the consequence of the moral theme. Right. Okay. Like Norma Ray. I just rewatched that. Norma Ray, Sally Field. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it. Okay, darn. Because I was going to say it has so many themes in it. It's not just like this feminist mm -hmm. sort of movie. There's also the theme of sort of like xenophobia. I don't know if that's actually a theme. Mm. But this union organizer comes to this small town where they need that mill. That's where all the jobs have been for years. That's where mm. everyone's families worked. They don't want to rock the boat with yeah. the owners. If they try to like strike out and get better wages, get better working conditions, it's going to bite them because mm -hmm. they, they'll just be expendable. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the theme of that movie we would think is more about her standing up, her standing up to her father, her standing up to some of these men that have maybe used her or whatever. Mm. She's willingly allowed that. But it's also about um, seeing a world that's outside of this small little microcosm that you've been in. Yeah. You know, she's only seen this little small town, this this hard mill working life where the conditions are bad. I'm trying to think of what the name of the theme would be. As you said, it's it's a moral theme is about sort of morals. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what's a moral to you? A moral. Well, is it about values? Is it about I consider stealing wrong? Let's say. Mm. I see something of my neighbors that's out there that's accidentally there. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it's okay for me to take? No. Hmm. Even okay. if I don't like the person, I don't want to take it because so it's wrong. Why would it be wrong? Because it doesn't belong to me. I didn't pay for it. And what are the consequences of doing that? Maybe nothing, but I would know about it. Okay. And I think that's where... So that might inform the way you see the world and your behavior. And, and how I look in the mirror at myself. Yeah. Because then I feel like, uh, I don't know if I can justify that to myself taking something. If so it else. might carry on certain individual consequences and then you'd have yeah. to pay a certain price for that. Even if this person didn't know it. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I define moral, morality as the rules of survival, right? And a theme is a rule of the universe. So what we're constantly trying to do as homo sapiens is we're trying to find out how the universe works and the best way to navigate it. And it's through narratives that we learn these value systems. That's why we're constantly sharing these new stories because we're constantly, every single day, trying to find out how the world has changed so that we can adapt to it. And it's always been this constant rate of change. And, we, and story is the mechanism for adaptation. That's why I really don't buy into this escapist um, approach. So, so theme being these rules of the universe, like every story has multiple themes to it. But I would say that a, a very compelling story tends to have a clear hierarchy of themes. So what's a good example? Um, we'll start with uh, Back to the Future. Okay. It's simple. Um, <laughs> uh, like what, are, what, are, what can we extrapolate from uh, Back to the Future? Like what, what, what are the rules of survival that we can learn from Back to the Future? Oh, there's so many. Um, it sounds like some of it's about family, protecting family, 
Mm. Um, and then learning your history. Mm. Okay. Um, having a better understanding of yourself through your history. And then um, it is another sort of a fish out of water scenario. Yeah. Um, not understanding the social mores and rules of that time frame, of that area. Cool. So you're pulling a whole bunch of different rules of the universe that he had to deal with, that Marty McFly had to deal with. You essentially start out with a character who's always late, he has a little bit of an inferiority complex, he's seen as a loser by the principal and all this stuff. And so he's in a bit of this uh, shifting identity. His, his identity is like, why is my life so miserable? How come I don't have everything I want? Which we all identify sure, with. Yeah. And then by him going back in time, he starts to learn that it was the choices of his parents that directly affected where he was. And by throwing himself in the middle of that, those choices begin to shift and evolve. And then you know, he gets to have a fantasy of like what it would be like if things were different. Um, so at, at the core of it, usually what we're looking for is one central theme that informs everything. I, that's usually defined by what I would call the moral imperative, which is the rule, um, the rule of survival that informs the entire story. Um, so ultimately he learns that he shouldn't fuck with time or time will, or they'll have to, have to pay the consequence. But ultimately through this whole experience, he learns that by getting to know his parents in a completely different way, by identifying with them at the same age where he was, he sees that they had an opportunity to become to, to be people he would actually care about rather than just being kind of his parents and they're boring They're actually people that he would have interacted with and cared a great deal for and then when he comes back He sees how different everything is which always has a little bit of an irony to it. I know but, uh, but you see how they were set in these roles and How he just saw them as one way when and they were sort of these tragic roles in, in a way yeah. You know, but what do you think his relation to Doc is? What's the theme there? I was always fascinated by Doc yeah. Why do you think that is? Why were you fascinated by him? Because he was this sort of brilliant guy that no one understood and um, people were sort of afraid of him. Like, oh, he was almost evil, yeah. but he wasn't. He was, he was misunderstood. You know, the people always say, oh, he's not a bad person, he's just misunderstood. Yeah. But it doesn't really seem like a bad person. I, I mean, I love Christopher Lloyd, but I always felt like Doc was a bit of a device. Like he was... Uh, I mean, what was their interaction? I mean, it eventually over the sequels and stuff, they started to care about each other. But ultimately, you're always wondering, like, why is this teenager hip hanging out with this doc? <laughs> but it works for the story. You know, you just, you just buy it, you invest in it. But, um, but yeah, ultimately, with stories, we're looking for a central theme that informs all the other themes. Like, for example, uh, the Royal Tenenbaums. You know, essentially, it's about learning to love people, like learning to let people live their own lives and still love them regardless because Royal was always trying to control the way everybody behaved and that ended up causing this massive identity crisis for his entire family until everyone's miserable, depressed, and separated from each other. So it's when they come back and he's like, tries to reconnect with all of them that he starts to impose his old value system. He tries to manipulate people because he doesn't trust them to love him. So it's not until he learns, if I just love them for who they are, if I just let my son and adopted daughter fall in love with each other and without judgment then they then they're going to figure it out for themselves and they'll love me regardless and that was like that was the core lesson that he needed to learn which is that you know accept people for who they are and then then you can love them for who they are without trying to change them into something else and so that i would say that's the central theme and then every other story after that like for example uh Oh, uh, Luke Wilson's character, Ten uh, Ricky Tenenbaum. Anyway, Luke Wilson's character in the Tenenbaums. He, um, his central theme was he felt extremely imposed upon by his parents' values. That's why, he, you know, he wore the headband. Like his identity of success, or his identity was being a successful tennis player, and um, so he always felt like he was carrying around the baggage of his parents' expectations which directly informs his, his deeper inner desire, which was that he was in love with Margot. And uh, so it was through this process of learning to just let go, to let his heart be broken, and then eventually 
that Royal learned to love him for who he was, that, he, that they were able to let go of this baggage. And so that would be kind of a supporting theme that ties into the central theme, which is letting people be who they are and then loving them regardless.